If you saw my video game history video on Ralph Baer, you'll remember that the first home console was the Magnavox Odyssey. Developed between 1967 and 1972, it was a console unit that plugged into your television with two built-in wired controllers, 12 games, and came with plastic spinners, dice, screen overlays, and a light gun developed by Japanese toy manufacturer Nintendo. It retailed for almost $100, that's over $600 in 2022 dollars, and despite a botched marketing plan had its sales boosted by the popularity of Pong and Pong clones. If people wanted to play Pong at home, they had to buy an Odyssey. Only fair considering that Atari's Nolan Bushnell had borrowed the concept for Pong from a trade show demonstration of the Odyssey, right? So, in 1975, demand for Pong was still high, and advances in integrated circuit technology allowed manufacturers to do far more with far less. Magnavox released updated versions of the Odyssey in the form of the Odyssey 100 and Odyssey 200, contracting with Texas Instruments to replace the original dedicated circuitry with three relatively cheap chips. To cut costs further, they dropped most of the original games, focusing instead on the tennis, hockey, and handball variants that people were crazy for. The 100 and 200 were also single units that hooked up to the television without the detachable controllers or game cards sported by the original. The Odyssey 200 retailed for $109.95, again, around $600 in modern money, with all three games featuring audio effects and on-screen scoring in the form of a rectangle that would slowly advance across the screen as players scored on each other. The 100 was the budget option produced to avoid fears of being undercut, dropping the handball variant in scoring, retailing for a cheaper $69.95. With no home competitors, Magnavox saw sales to the tune of over 300,000 combined units over the next three years, despite the damage the original Odyssey's poor sales had done. Competition arrived in late 1974, courtesy of Universal Research Labs. If you recall from our Pong clone video, Allied Leisure had been an established electromechanical coin-op manufacturer when the Pong craze hit, so they could produce most of what they needed in-house. For circuit boards and other electronics, they contracted out to Universal Research Labs, or URL. At the height of the Pong craze, demand was so high that URL was having to buy components in bulk to keep up. Then came the devastating fire that gutted Allied Leisure's manufacturing plant, leaving URL holding millions of dollars of Pong-specific electronics with no buyer. Rather than selling at a loss or looking for a new client, URL co-founder Bill Olages decides to use the parts to develop a Pong unit for the home consumer market. The result was the video action series of dedicated ball and paddle consoles. They offered three variants, tennis, hockey, and soccer, and came in multiple form factors. The Model 1 was a pedestal with a built-in 12-inch black-and-white TV with four control discs retailing for $499.00 which is almost 3000 in today money. The Model 2 was the same thing, but without the built-in TV. It sold better because by this point, 90% of households in the US already had a television, and it was $200 cheaper. The Model T was a cocktail model built into a table, and the MP, which was another cocktail model, contained volleyball and four-count tennis. Most of these were available in coin-op variants for commercial use. Ultimately, the video auction had very little impact on the market, being poorly marketed and priced far higher than everything else. Now, Nolan Bushnell had been interested in developing a home Pong unit as early as 1973, but the technology hadn't been economically feasible until 74. Their prototype was codenamed Darlene after an attractive employee, which is a good indication of what the company culture was like. What eventually became Home Pong had a sharper image and better controls than the Odyssey or video action lines, but only one game, Pong. It was also cheaper to produce. The cost of the integrated circuits had dropped significantly, and Atari engineers were able to get Pong to fit on a single integrated circuit chip. Selling it turned out to be more difficult than developing it. The Odyssey's sales hadn't been great, and $100 was expensive for toy stores to consider. In the end, they ended up approaching Sears Roebuck. Sears had been interested in carrying the Odyssey, only to be stymied by Magnavox Management's exclusivity policies. They were only allowing the unit to be carried by Magnavox dealerships. 
Sears wasn't allowed to carry the game in their stores, though Magnavox did consent to let them carry it in their catalog. So, when Atari approached them, Sears enthusiastically agreed, with a few conditions. First, the unit would be rebranded as the Sears Telegames Pong, and while the brand was strong enough that Sears let them keep the Atari logo on the unit, they were forbidden from releasing an Atari-branded Home Pong for one year. Secondly, they wanted 150,000 units by Christmas. Despite lacking anything close to that level of manufacturing capacity, Nolan Bushnell agreed. Atari once again needed to expand, and once again, the banks were refusing to lend them money. Salvation came in the form of investor Don Valentine, who'd recently formed venture fund Sequoia Capital and was looking for Northern California tech companies to invest in. He sunk $600,000 in Atari and arranged for additional contributions from other venture capital companies, enabling Atari to turn the old key games facilities into a manufacturing center for home pong units. They turned out the most complex large-scale integrated circuits used in a consumer project to date, with on-screen scoring and full-color graphics. It sold out as fast as it could be produced. As with Coin-Op Pong, this success spawned a new gold rush where over 70 other companies hustled to bring video tennis units to market in 1976. Chip manufacturers like National Semiconductor and Texas Instruments jumped into developing their own chips capable of running their own pawn and paddle games, but General Instruments' AY38500 chip made it to market first, becoming the industry leader. The AY38500 offered six games, four ball and paddle variants, then two target shooting games. They were only offering black and white graphics, but the chips were incredibly cheap at $5 a pop for wholesale customers, and General Instruments was woefully unprepared for the massive demand that followed. So much so that only their first company, Coleco, was able to score their full shipment. Now, Coleco is a big enough topic for their own episode, and we'll get around to that eventually. So the short version was that in the 1970s they were a toy manufacturer and the largest providers of above-ground swimming pools in the world, but were looking to diversify into products for the winter months. A lower-end Pong console seemed like a decent possibility, so Coleco started meeting with chip manufacturers. The first stop was General Instruments. Based in New York, they were the closest major manufacturer to Coleco's Connecticut offices. GI revealed that they'd been working on a Pong chip, and Coleco partners with Alpex Computing Corporation to develop the hardware of what becomes the Telstar. Named after the 60s communication satellite, the Telstar accommodated three of the six ball and paddle variants on the chip and retails for $70, far cheaper than the Atari Home Pong. Coleco wanted a June release to coincide with Father's Day, but ran into trouble with the FCC. The Telstar was causing too much RF interference. They offered a second test at the end of the week, but if they failed again, Coleco would be moved to the back of the queue behind all of the other consoles vying for FCC approval. Now, Coleco just doesn't have the facility to test its RF emissions alone, let alone a quick redesign, but fortunately, Ralph Baer, yep, the father of the Odyssey, is now contracting out as an electronics game design consultant, and he has access to the facilities to measure RF. Needless to say, the Telstar passed their second test, and Coleco ended 1976 dominating the Pong console market, selling almost a million units by the end of the year. They went on through 1977, developing new variations of the Telstar with different sets of the AY38500 chips games under different model names, including the Colormatic, which added a second chip to provide color graphics, and the Ranger, which included a light game for target shooting games. Likewise, Japan was seeing its own home pong machines, beginning with Epoch's TV Tennis Electro Tennis, released several months before Atari's home pong, and notable largely for the fact that it was a wireless system. While other home pong consoles connected via RF, Electro Tennis used UHF frequencies to broadcast the images shown on screen. The most successful pong console in Japan, though, was the Color TV and Game line released by the future gaming giant Nintendo in 1977. While they'd helped develop the light gun for the Magnavox's Odyssey some years before, the Color TV game was Nintendo's first direct foray into the video game industry. The Color TV game didn't come out until 1977, which is relatively late in the game for the first generation, 
Around the time that Atari was releasing the VCS in the US, into a Japanese market already saturated with dedicated Pong units, mostly released by television manufacturers. Nintendo's president at the time, Hiroshi Yamiuchi, wasn't impressed by home technology compared to what the arcades could offer, but when approached by consumer electronics giant Mitsubishi for a potential partnership, he saw little risk in the attempt. The resulting line of five consoles proved to be the most popular, selling over a million units of the Color TV Game 6 and Color Game TV 15 each, and a half million of the Color TV Game Racing units. This unexpected but welcome success led to both Nintendo's entrance into the arcade market and the eventual development of the family computer system, the Famicom. A bewildering number of smaller manufacturers tried to jump into the gold rush that was the dedicated console, and while the market could bear it for a little while, ultimately they were limited by their technology. There simply wasn't demand for systems that you need to rebuy every year to play new games, especially at prices comparable to what we ourselves pay for new consoles. In a way, the first generation of consoles was doomed from the start, but fortunately for the market, a new paradigm of console was coming. The programmable console, with the Fairchild Channel F, and the second generation of home video game systems. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more of my video game history videos.